Welcome to Epicenter, the show which talks about the technologies, projects, and people driving decentralization and the blockchain revolution. I'm Felix, and I'm here with Mihai Roy. Today, we're speaking with Marco Bericevic, who is the product lead of the Cosmos SDK. The Cosmos SDK is a framework to build application-specific blockchains in the Cosmos ecosystem. Hi, Marco, and welcome to Epicenter. Hey, thanks for having me. It's definitely an honor being on the show that I've been listening to for so many years. Yeah, we're, we're super glad to have you as like such a long-term contributor to, to the Cosmos ecosystem and, and beyond. So yeah, we're very excited to hear today about the Cosmos ecosystem. But as usual, we get started a little bit with your background in, in crypto and how, how you got started and what brought you to where you are today. Yeah, um, I had a bit of a different uh, entrance into crypto. Actually, like during the 2017 ICO boom, a bunch of friends of mine were making a bunch of money. And before that, I read about Bitcoin, but never got uh, fully into it. They were making a bunch of money. And for some reason for me, I wasn't like, oh, I'm going to go make a bunch of money. I was like, I want to learn how this stuff works and why it is why it is decentralized. And around that time is when I started to uh, really dive deep into learning how to code. And then soon after that, I joined a enterprise blockchain company. And that was a lot of fun. Um, we were using Quorum. Um, from JP Morgan and writing a lot of smart contracts, writing a lot of tooling around that. Um, had a couple of fun like projects. It was, uh, I find that consultancies are a lot like hackathons. Like every two, three months, you have to develop a product and they just give you the specs of the product and you just have to write code. So it was a lot of fun, learned a lot. And then I ran across um, a like one of the senior engineers at the enterprise consultancy showed me a video of Ethan Buckman and Jay Kwan talking about the Tendermint and the Cosmos SDK at a Bitcoin meetup in like SF. And I just remember becoming so enamored by it. And I was just like, uh, I don't care where in the world this is. I just want to work with these people. And then uh, a couple months later, I found out that they're actually, they, ha they have a team based in Berlin. And so I applied and then it took a bit of persistence. And four months later, I joined, uh, all in bits or Tendermint Inc. And the rest is history. I started out as developer relations engineer um, and worked as an engineer on Tendermint for two years and then came back up to the Cosmos SDK. Right. Yeah. Awesome. So this is like you getting started. What what year is this? Uh, I joined uh, 2019. So like two months after the hub launched, after the Cosmos hub launched. And then I guess, yeah, now you're You've like familiarized yourself with Tenderman and you started to work on the Cosmos SDK, which we're here to talk about today. And maybe for the listeners, right, like you can explain a little bit on a very high level what the Cosmos SDK is and maybe how it has moved through the history since I think it's right. It's probably like the most integral part of Cosmos ecosystem in, in some way, right? So it really helps to get some context. The Cosmos SDK, like Tenderman, has had a few teams um, working on it. The Cosmos SDK, I think, were on the third team. So initially, it was written by the team at All in Bits, which included um, uh, Alex Bez, Rigel, uh, Aditya, Dave, Sunny, um, Jack, Samplin, Saki. Like they were all involved. Um, but back then, it was a lot different than it is today. Like it was kind of uh, all all there was back then was forking Bitcoin, forking Get, and then early days of Substrate and the Cosmos SDK, and that was really it. There wasn't much out there in the ecosystem, so there wasn't much um, user feedback. Uh, and then when uh, Cosmos went through what we describe as like Gore 2020, the great organizational restructuring, we kind of like shifted and, and moved into a new team, Region Network, and they became the sole owners and maintainers of the Cosmos SDK. And they led it for about two to three years. And then uh, I came in to kind of uh, they, like the Cosmos SDK has this thing of it's very hard to hire a project manager because you get burnt out really fast because you have to deal with an entire ecosystem of people complaining, people asking for features, people wanting different designs. And it's just constantly like a feedback loop now, better more so than it was before. But not only that is you have to also keep up with what's going on in the block in the wider blockchain ecosystem. So it's like a certain balance to strike. And there's a few people that attempted and then kind of just gave up. Um, it was just too much work and too much overhead and uh, too much too much craziness. Um, I like to attribute my like not being able to be burnt out to Zucky and Jack just because uh, they also just like constantly work, and so I learned that from them. But uh, yeah, so 
came into the Cosmos SDK, started leading it alongside Region, um, and then this year uh, the entire like maintenance of the Cosmos SDK shifted to a new entity, um, Binary Builders, um, which the core focus of that entity is the Cosmos SDK and the Builders program, the Energy and Builders program. So, I guess maybe we can, you know, get into like what is what is the Cosmos SDK as well. So, right, I guess most people are familiar with the notion of the like, smart contracts, right, and Ethereum, and you're building your application, and you're building a smart contract. Now, the Cosmos SDK is essentially the first or like one of the first like frameworks to build application specific blockchains, and um, that's become like much more popular nowadays. Uh, this sort of paradigm, which we'll also get into, but I guess at, at the start, maybe we can just dive into why, why is that, right? Why is, what's the benefit over having your own Cosmos chain in this case over like just writing a smart contract? So, I mean, there, there's always this like dilemma of, uh, the, the single computer to rule the world, um, where we all have to share computation versus like, um, hat owning your own computation and then maybe posting data on this one world computer. And so the app chain vision um, came from the need that, hey, like we, uh, well, first of all, the Cosmos SDK kind of came from like, hey, we're building the Cosmos Hub, and we we have this vision of app chains, and what better is it to like develop a software development kit, um, an SDK to allow people to build app chains, and this became this was kind of like the early on vision. And the Cosmos SDK, okay, now you can control your own computation. You can do a lot more things that, than uh, you could in the Ethereum space or in other spaces because you control, uh, you have a lot more granular control over your gas, your computation, and over your logic as well. And so this really fed into, oh, like we can really develop what we want and not be limited. And this is like when we had the like Cosmos summer, um, I believe it was like last summer or two summers ago. And we saw a lot of application specific chains coming up uh, to Cosmos and kind of like really honing in on specific use cases for the application blockchain. Then I, I would say like people started discovering that like, hey, it's actually a lot harder to get product market fit because everyone like in crypto, we have this like craze of like VCs come in, there's a lot of money, you launch a token, okay, now you have runway. Now you, ha you have X amount of years to figure out your product market fit. And a lot of people were kind of like going with that. And I think not only in Cosmos, but in the wider ecosystem. And then it all of a sudden shifted to like, okay, now we have to go. Now I, I believe that we are going into a world where we have to have uh, PMF before you launch your chain. Otherwise, it's just going to be kind of an empty chain, no blocks and so on. But today it's like the, the SDK really, like the sole purpose that out of, by default it is able to do is like a application blockchain, um, application specific blockchain. And for this, like everyone thinks that Cosmos SDK is like, this is all you can do, but we are kind of like shifting into the rollup space. And it's like kind of a, like, why would we want to like shift away from blockchains into the rollup space? Well, it's like, if you look at the blowing a smart contract, like a smart contract is an amazing way to really go to market really fast and search for your product market fit. And it's very easy. You can deploy in different ecosystems. You can partner with these ecosystems and so on. And then like, if we put that on a scale of zero through 10, let's say smart contracts are the easiest. It's like a zero. Um, you can deploy it same day, launch your, launch your product, and you don't have to worry about inflation validators and so on. And let's say deploying your own blockchain is like eight to 10. Um, because you have to now control a binary, you have to control your validator set, you have to work with them, you have to claim centralization, um, you have to work through governance and all these things. It is very difficult. It, it's not an easy endeavor to take on. And we have been fortunate enough that a lot of people in Cosmos have taken this endeavor on and learned, and we've been able to take that knowledge and give it to newcomers. But the problem is, like, what is that in between? Um, and that in between, um, I'm kind of coming to the conclusion that it's kind of the roll-up. So you have like the two, four, six, eight of the roll-ups um, from decentralized uh, to shared sequencing to, uh, to decentralized sequencing. And that kind of like fills up. So it's like now all of a sudden it's like you deploy a smart contract, you're gaining a bit more adoption, but you don't know if you want to invest all this money into developing your own chain and um, doing a whole migration. So let's do a centralized roll-up. If you don't need the decentralization part, and then you start wanting to expand your product, then you go into the decentralized sequencing, and then all of a sudden you're like, okay, wait, actually, like 
uh, we are seeing that we're paying a lot of fees um, to these different protocols for data availability and settlement. Now it's time that like, okay, maybe we own this for ourselves because our token may have a lot of value, a large market cap. And so then let's go to our own chain. Um, and so I'm kind of seeing that as um, the direction that people are starting to go. And I think DYDX is kind of the perfect example of that. That's really interesting. Do you think that if the future customer journey is is going to look more like DYDX, started off in a smart contract on Ethereum, then went to an L2 or a roll-up, in this case, StartNet, and then the third step to come in a couple of months maybe is their own Cosmos chain. Do you think there's a there's a risk that the Cosmos SDK is developing the application chain development framework, but it doesn't really have like a roll-up development framework and ecosystem today that by default people will go and develop in the their rollups with the ethereum stack and then jumping from a rollup working on the ethereum stack to cosmos sdk will just prove so much of a big software development challenge that nobody will actually go into the cosmos sdk stack in the future at all but rather some other stack will yeah so will, in know. in this sense we are like shifting um, a bit. So the idea, so working very closely with the WorldKit team um, from Celestia and teams like Dimension. Um, and the goal there is that in the ideal world, so now we're doing some uh, refactors of the core layer. Uh, in an ideal world, the user will potentially, like let's say a user develops a smart contract on Ethereum. Now they want to uh, set, still settle and do DA on Ethereum. They can use Rollkit with SDK, let's say with Polaris or Ethermint, um, and then they just migrate their contracts. They have the same UX, and the users don't know there's a difference. And then in the future, the goal is that they can swap Rollkit out for Comet or a different consensus engine, and then the actual state machine will be able to stay the same. And so this is kind of the direction we're going, where the user journey we're trying to create. And so, um, yeah, we're working, uh, we were just talking before before the call, but um, we were just talking about fraud proofs and validity proofs and how like Cosmos um, plans to take advent uh, uh, enter into that world. Um, and so we're working quite closely with the Celestia and the Rollkit team in order to really dive into fraud proofs, first of all, um, and then later on validity proofs. That's super awesome. And I think we're, we're going to go much back into it. I think maybe we can take it a step back also because most people that listen to this probably don't really have a good view of like how the Cosmos SDK is structured. So maybe we can talk a little bit about, you know, like one of the core concepts in my view, right? in, in the Cosmos SDK is this idea of the modules, right? You have like these sort of swappable features that you can kind of plug in to your chain or you build a new module that, that kind of can be used by the rest of the Cosmos SDK ecosystem. So can you talk a little bit about that? What sort of modules are there? more on this for screen builds? So like the, the SDK and the the direction that we've been um, trying to articulate it to users and new users coming in is it is a separation between the kernel space and the user space. And when I say the kernel space, this is like where the modules live. Um, and so the thing why we consider it the kernel space is because you can handle a lot more computation at this level. The gas um, functionality is a lot more freeing and it's not limiting like you would have in a virtual machine and so uh, some of the modules are like staking governance bank some like uh, authorization um, modules uh, you have slashing um, minting distribution kind of like these basic things and these things um, they do and they do go by themselves in terms of like uh, they don't need external intervention to enable or to like mint a bunch of tokens and everything. So they do handle a bit more computation. Um, and so when users come to the Cosmos SDK, it's like, hey, like a lot of users are using um, VMs and we're totally fine with that. And we encourage people to use VMs, especially if they're going in the permissionless environment, um, that they just want users to deploy like uh, Juno and Evmos um, and others. But like the kernel space is really where the application has the most performance, but also has the ability to do a lot more computation for the functionality they maybe want to do from the VM. So maybe the VM calls into the, the user space 
So the VM calls into the kernel space, the modules, um, and then they are able to do a lot more, a lot more things there. So, uh, what can you like expand on? Like, what some of these things might be? I think like some of the things that that like a VM would be limited by. So, like w within a VM, it's like you are um, gas metered. Um, so you do consume gas on every pump, on every uh, functionality, on all the functionality, all the business logic. Um, and so, you, and you don't want users to do a lot because it is a it is potentially a permissionless environment. And so, allowing people to have kind of unlimited computation is a, a DOS vector. And so, within the modules, um, within the kernel space. Like that's more of the application developer needs to, um, it, they need to propose an upgrade, uh, and then that upgrade needs to be adopted by validators. And so it's a lot more of a involved process. And so here the computation is only around IO, um, around the, uh, disc. And so once you're doing computation, like, uh, let's say if you're doing some proving capabilities, um, or if you're doing some bridging technology. Within a VM, you have to do gas metering on the actual computation of the proving of the hashing and so on. While within the Cosmos SDK, within the kernel space, that is a lot more freeing. And so you can do it, and then that won't affect your entire um, block gas consumption. Um, and a lot of people may think that, like, oh, this is a DOS vector. But if it does end up in some sort of chain of the chain slowing down, then it is actually the uh, application chain it was application developers fault because they did this premeditated um computation in their chain before and it wasn't like an end user just like causing this a lot causing this amount of computation to slow down the chain right i think one example here actually i guess is sort of this reward distribution on osmosis right where it actually like they have these epochs and then at the boundary you need to compute a lot how where the LP rewards go to and this for example can slow down the chain just so we have an example exactly like uh, the interesting thing there is uh, so th there is like this thing in, in the Cosmos SDK called begin block and end block and what these really signify is at the beginning of every lock uh, beginning of every block before the computation um, before the uh, state machine executes the transactions what computation do you want to run before that? And then an end block does the same thing just after the execution of the transactions. And so within this, like in the Osmosis case, they are doing a lot of computation for the LPs of the pools. And so that is like causing a lot of, um, causing the chain, the state machine to kind of slow down a bit. Uh, and, but this is known. It's like, as more users come in, it's just like, um, I think it's maybe like 10 minutes or less now that the chain kind of just like, stops everyone's doing computation and then once everyone's done with computation it continues as normal is it correct to think of think of it like this that when you look at ethereum in ethereum so with any chain there's kind of like core logic that you need to run the chain itself and then there is kind of customizable logic that people can put for their own use case when the chain goes live, which are like smart contracts. In Ethereum, Ethereum has this philosophy that, so when you think of like the core logic you need to run any chain, well, maybe like an example is kind of like the staking, this is the staking system, right? Um, how, how do validators get spun up? How does the chain get spun up? How do validators get torn down? How does slashing happen? How does the uh, native token of the chain, in the case of Ethereum, it's an Ether, in the case of Osmos is the Osmo token, um, how is that represented? What is the code that kind of handles that token? So there are all of these kind of like core functions, the native token, uh, staking, slashing, maybe something around governance that any chain needs. And then there are kind of customizable pieces where when you launch the chain in the first uh, the first time, you have the core functionality. You don't even know what kind of customer-sizable functionality the market is going to demand. So you want a way by which people can put their customizable logic on the chain. And that's in the form of smart contracts everywhere. In Ethereum, kind of the philosophy is that the Ethereum developers want to put all of this core logic of the blockchain 
as smart contract. So in Ethereum, like the staking is handled as a staking smart contract. So when you are actually staking on Ethereum, you are sending a transaction into an Ethereum smart contract written in Solidity, audited in audited in that language, and and then staking is a core functionality of the chain, but it is handled as a as a smart contract. So Ethereum makes that explicit choice that even the core function, like more and more of the core functionality of the chain should be written as smart contracts and go in that direction in the future. Whereas in the Cosmos SDK, the kind of philosophy is let's separate out the two. So there is, let's call one thing like the kernel space where the assumption is that this will handle core functionality of the smart contract. What does it mean when staking, slashing, native token, bridging to other chains, maybe in the future generating zero knowledge proofs, maybe producing hash functions, producing hashes. These are core things that the chain needs. Let's keep this in a kernel module. Uh, let's kind of enable the developer of the chain to be able to sort of optimize these core modules for, for their use case. And then on each of these Cosmos chains, there can be also the customizable side, which is a VM that's running on the chain. And the VM can be of three or four different designs and sort of like the VM becomes kind of like this user space and the VM and the core can seamlessly interact with each other. And it's kind of like a, almost like a philosophical difference on, on, on how to do development between sort of Ethereum and the Cosmos ecosystem. Yeah, I, I'd say like the the biggest difference is like the Cosmos SDK is is a software development kit, less so framework. And so um, while we think that it's like it's very uh, powerful to write things in native code, and so you don't have this like uh, performance potential overhead uh, bottleneck um, of writing it in the VM in the smart contract layer that. Um, like that, that doesn't need to be done by everyone. And there are users of the Cosmos SDK who do write core functionality within VMs and then just pass it down to the, pass it down to the SDK. And so we do, the, the goal of the SDK is to be less opinionated than other frameworks. So it's like, hey, like this is the Ethereum way. You can do it that way if you want. Like if you pull uh, Ethermint or Polaris into it, you can write everything in Solidity. You can take the same code from Ethereum and put it in call staking functions. All you need to do is like return like the validator set update and stuff like that. You can do that all from the VM. It just, you're going to have some performance overhead instead of just doing your with native code. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, I'd say like the, that's the key differentiator that, and I really love like honing in on that just because, um, everyone does think of kind of like same thing with like IBC, SDK and like Comet. Um, they are all are like uh, SDKs and less so frameworks. Um, and if they're not today, then like they're all going in the direction of more of an SDK than a framework or um, an easier term like a library. So people can compose their application without being forced to do it the single way. Right. So really, it's like more flexible and not dictating so much how to do it. Do you foresee like some of the teams or like someone else to build like a more opinionated thing framework on top of the sort of more flexible Cosmos SDK. So like maybe people could reuse, you know, what Ethermin, how they build their chain and they that's like another sort of framework on top of the core flexible Cosmos SDK. Exactly. So the 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 downside of this approach is that it becomes it has the potential to become like a multi many levels of frameworks, many levels of libraries. Um, that people compose. And so like um, talking with Polaris and Etherman, they have this like EVM on top and they're both going in um, drastically different approaches. Um, Polaris is kind of like a, they're developing a separate process that is kind of like a library that can be plugged into many different frameworks um, or many different SDKs. Etherman is a bit more tightly coupled to the SDK, but they still have things that you can add on, um, features, plugins and stuff like that. And so that is like a, a downside that it's like once you hit, once you go too modular, then people people generally don't know which direction to go because it's too freeing. And this is, is this definitely is something that I've like seen um, with other SDKs and frameworks in the blockchain ecosystem that it's like they're so unopinionated 
that it becomes harder to use because it's harder to find examples um, just because everyone does it so differently. Um, and so we're trying to be mindful of that when we're doing, when we're kind of reshaping the Cosmos SDK in order to take advantage of um, these new worlds that are emerging like rollups. Maybe before we go into rollups, like we could go into, in, a, in your experience, what have been the unique selling points of the Cosmos SDK and what are kind of like some of the success stories it has had in the, in the past? The Cosmos SDK has, um, because it's been around for so long, it does have a wide range of users. So um, the Binance chain, uh, the BNB chain is used with, is built with Cosmos SDK. The new Greenfield project from Binance is also using the Cosmos SDK. There's going to be Celestia, um, DYDX, um, Wormhole, um, kind of the, the list is kind of ongoing. And there's a lot of users that we also don't know about. We have a lot of enterprise users that kind of um, hide that they're enterprise and come and ask questions. And then we, we like help them. And then after like they ask to sign an NDA or like some contract, then we discover that it's like some enterprise using the Cosmos SDK. So there's definitely been a wide range of users that have been adopting the Cosmos SDK. I think it's also like Go, the language has like become this, uh, I, mean, I might get some ridicule for it, but it's kind of like Java-esque in the enterprise world um, that people are willing to adopt Go in um, nowadays in the larger enterprise world. And so since we're written in Go, and it's not like too complicated to write um, then, and it's fairly easy to understand because it is somewhat opinionated right now, then people are like, okay, I can come in, do this, and I know it works. But I mean, I have also, so like in the past, um, when I was in the SDK, I spent more time playing around with different frameworks. So I have built a few things with Substrate, and I'm participated in a lot of uh, Solana and Near hackathons. And I've been keeping up with the OP stack and Arbitrum and recently been um, reading up on the Hyper SDK and the Avalanche world. So it is, um, for me, it's like I'm not like a Cosmos maxi. Um, according to Sunny, everyone in Cosmos is like a Bitcoin maxi at heart. Um, so it's like we're just lovers of, of tech and we just like to see what other people are doing and like how they're doing it, but also learn from each other. I think... Um, in this space and open source entirely, like it's an amazing place to like learn from others and be able to grow um, and really reshape what you're thinking about. And so been keeping up with all those things and um, seeing the directions they are going and how that can influence the SDK. And then also um, with some of the teams, we also do talk on a regular basis. And so we we throw ideas at each other to try and challenge what we can do with our frameworks. Yeah, I think one of the core like I guess always like selling points of Cosmos in general, right, is, is IBC and sort of the promise to be able to bridge like without having to have some like sort of multi-sig bridge and, and just doing it like natively sort of more or less in inside the, between the protocols. And I guess that's also where I at least see like some of these other frameworks that don't have IBC sort of maybe struggling or like trying to some different approaches is, is that like correct in your sense or can you explain a little bit how IBC fits in the Cosmos SDK space and maybe like how even other frameworks or how are they approaching interoper interoperability and if that's if that is like one of the unique things in Cosmos or if other frameworks can also adopt IBC in, in kind of the current state in your opinion? Yeah, definitely. I think IBC um, has a lot more potential than only Cosmos and I think the Cosmos SDK is enticing for a lot of users because it's just like, hey, like I can launch a chain and immediately get access to other chains. They don't have to launch um, a module or a smart contract on my chain. I don't have to do these partnerships. It just becomes trustless and I can just launch it um, day one. And like the ecosystem in Cosmos, the relayer ecosystem is very willing to just run relayers right now. Um, there is There is like fees being worked out. Um, in protocol fees for them, but um, the, the growth of IBC has really helped shape Cosmos and the users of Cosmos. Definitely other frameworks, it's interesting to see. So at the core, IBC is more, it's a library as well. Um, and it's like, you can really compose different clients. And so when we look at IBC today, everyone's like, oh, this is like Cosmos's thing. Um, but at the end of the day, it, the implementation within IBC Go is a Tendermint like client um, verifier. And so if you were to 
but this is only a single client. You can have different clients for babe, grandpa, hotshot, all, all these different consensus protocols um, that, and also that once you get out of consensus protocols, you can have different, like you can have fraud proof clients, you can have validity proof clients that like IBC now can work within these different ecosystems. And this has been like a thing that's gaining adoption within the IBC teams. And so they are working on like expanding it. And I always see it benefiting the Cosmos SDK even more because all of a sudden, like if you can communicate um, trustlessly and establish connections between rollups a lot easier than, hey, we need to go get a bridging protocol to come in and um, deploy on us. We have to go do BD. We have to go do partnership. We have to do all this stuff to, oh, like I can connect to base day one and not have to worry about anything. I can do like interchain accounts with base. I can do interchain accounts with um, the uh, optimism uh, rollup or with Zora or with all these other things. Then it's all of a sudden a, a huge game changer where people were like, okay, in order for me to find product market fit, I need to build something that also uses all these other protocols. And up until now, it's been pretty siloed in like how to get that adoption. So. Yeah, let's 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 see how kind of like Cosmos SDK compares to these other frameworks that you've experimented with. So that they do like Substrate. Maybe we can start with Substrate. Yeah, w what are the big differences between Cosmos SDK and, and Substrate? Well, f first of all, it's written in Rust versus Go, and uh, I, I love to say that like blockchain people just love Rust um, over over anything. And so, um, but Substrate is like. The, I'd say it's very abstracted and the API surface is very large. Um, it's an amazing product. And like, as we've seen, like Avail is written in, is written using Substrate. Um, they were able to really accelerate um, their development cycle. And then we have um, the StarkMed sequencer, Madara, um, from the Lambda class people, and they're using Substrate as well. Um, and so it's very um, useful in what you can do. I think it's like, as you go down the stack, it becomes more and more complicated on how to swap out certain functionality. And then also Substrate now has this direction that they're kind of going in a more direction of WASM instead of native. And I think like the, that is like a really good direction because you can have like more sw uh, swappable things on the fly. But the downside is the user base kind of becomes limited because now the user base has to do everything within the WASM VM instead of doing it within native um, Rust code. The writing and like how you write a, a substrate, they call it a, a palette or a frame, I believe, um, has progressed a lot over the years. And for me, many times it's like if you're writing a new Rust SDK for rollups or chains, it's like it's very hard to compete with Substrate just because it's it has so much functionality already there that like if you were to try it, then you're always going to be um, at least a year behind Substrate. Um, so Substrate was Substrate's been really good. Um, Solana and Nier are like there. I, I was playing around with Solana in the early days. Um, it was a bit of a struggle to write uh, contracts in the early days. Now it's become a lot better. But um, at the same time, it's like you're you're developing a smart contract over a um, or an application specific chain or roll up. So it is a different world. Same thing with near nears UX is they did, they did a lot of focus on it. So it has been only getting better and quite simple to understand. But now it's like, now when we dive into like what's going on in the roll up space, I don't, it, it's all solidity. So like there isn't really a comparison. It's just like everyone just uses solidity. So it's like, if you write a solidity contract in one place, you can kind of carry it over to 10, 15 dif different other places just because it's all the same thing. Right. So even these frameworks like for OP stack or something, they are, they are written in solidity. Like o OP stacks, like written in go. Um, and I think Arbitrum's, um, stuff is written in rust, but they have like, a they call them wavum, but it's like, you end up deploying your code as a, um, smart contract. Now you can do pre-compiles. Um, with the OP stack, I believe you can write them in different languages. So here it's like you're using Go versus Rust again, but you're using a lot less of that code, um, of that language. You're kind of like defaulting always to Rust because it's, you launch the OP, you launch the rollup and it may be you or someone else running the, the rollup and it's usually a centralized sequencer and then posting 
um, data, but you don't have to worry about any of that core low le- low level stuff. It's all you really care about this solidity. I guess actually something that I wanted to ask is also around like, you know, I guess a lot of the people are now building infra again. We're in the bear market. There's not that many applications. There is liquidity on Ethereum, which probably explains also why a lot of things are focused around EVM, Ethereum in general. Now, I guess all these SDKs sort of also don't don't have really like a business model, right? Now, um, I guess there has been this struggle in Cosmos for the longest time since it was very designed very in this modular way where essentially like Adam, some people were even questioning what's the value accrual for Adam if there's like not the applications there, right? And then sort of ICS came along to kind of solve it a bit um, to basically go back to more this model where like the core chain like lends the security and can through that generate value for the core the token now you know how does that interact with sdk and what's like sort of your view of how this future plays out like what's the role of the sdk and in in, in, in in this like sort of token world and, and value accrual so it, it, it's like you definitely bring up a good point where the the cycle of like value accrual in that question is coming a lot faster in these other ecosystems. And it's like, okay, now like everyone's launching a roll up with these different stacks. Um, and maybe one of the, maybe these stacks kind of like optimism and arbitrum have their own like roll up or chain. Now, how does the value accrual come back to their token? Um, like Ethereum is a bit like pushing that like, oh, a roll up is technically uh, a, the definition of a rollup is something that burns ETH. And so in that world, it's like how, if, if you shift away from like burning ETH then all of a sudden, like what is the value of coral? Um, then how do you like stay aligned with Ethereum? Um, in Cosmos, yeah, it's, it's definitely been a hard and it's definitely hard being at the, um, at the core layer, just because you kind of have to always ask this question and working closely with the ICF, they're also, um, asking this question and like informal us uh, IBC team and many other teams are always kind of like thinking like how can we um, get funding from other teams as well because like the ICF funding won't last forever and so it is a hard question and I don't think we have a clear answer right now other than like oh let's go to community pools and like um, seek funding there but I don't think that's like a end all be all solution it's definitely like we can't change the licensing the interesting thing about cosmos is um if you contribute to many other ecosystems as a contributor you have to like sign a, C- a cla like sign your contribution over to the company operating or uh, facilitating the maintenance of the project in cosmos um, it's actually all developers own their own um, contributions and so uh, we can't necessarily change the license of code because we don't own all the code and or like um us the maintenance team and so on don't own all the code it's the it's the code owned by the ecosystem by the contributors and so that makes it even a bit harder because it's like if you want to shift the license then all of a sudden you need to seek approval from everyone who contributed over the years and it becomes like a larger issue with the roll-up space it is interesting seeing in like in paris at ecc People are already talking about like the fragmentation problem that's um, that they may have seen Cosmos and other ecosystems run into. That okay, now you have all these chains interconnected, but now you have USDC issued on all these different chains, and now how do you like um, interact? And you get this fragmentation of liquidity, fragmentation of users. Um, how do you bring that all together into like a single solid, um, like let's say front page for new users? instead of having to go search across like 50 different uh, front ends. And it's it's interesting to see that like that conversation is coming up earlier and it's going to be interesting to see what's come up. But at least in Cosmos right now, um, there is definitely a big push to try and align all these different apps, kind of create an app store. Um, but I think, and, and past that, uh, past the app store, there's also a lot of things that are like IBC that users are trying to make seamless. So like Skip is making it that you can unwind tokens with IBC. You can swap tokens. 
you don't have to have to you don't have to have gas on this other chain that you want to do the swap or something like that um and that it just works out of the box and these sort of ux wins is what's going to be really beneficial to end users because now all of a sudden when you go to a new chain you have to have their gas token in, the, in order to do that functionality but now it's like hey i want to swap x for y um i don't care what chain or what liquidity pool or what decks you go through it just works and it's kind of going in that direction so there's going to be a lot of these aggregators um that start popping up in cosmos and i think in the wider blockchain ecosystem squid is also a good example that it just like users interact with that and they, the use end user doesn't know where the funds are really coming from they display it but probably like the pro user cares but the end the normal retail user most likely just doesn't care they just want something to be received when they send something out Marco, it it seems like the like Cosmos SDK is kind of one of the most mature stacks to build an application spe application specific blockchain, and then you have all of these VMs also working on it, right? So the EVM specifically, but Cosmosm, Agoric, VM, all of them are working. Why is it that a project like Optimism needed to build their own SDK or like own blockchain development framework and why could they not borrow the Cosmos SDK itself for that purpose? Is there something in the Ethereum ecosystem where compatibility with the designs of L2 bridges means that you need to develop something on their own or could actually like the Cosmos SDK stack be used to build L2s in the Ethereum ecosystem? So, so I think like I mean, there's multiple answers and there's definitely a lot of people, everyone you talk to will give you a different answer. I do think that Cosmos SDK, like in, in its current form or the form that it was when um, Optimism decided to build out the OP stack, uh, what was maybe not fitting their use case. And maybe it was like too cumbersome to build um, with SDK. They needed to modify too much to the point where it was just like, okay, we just might as well like build their own since it's kind of like that would, that's what we would be doing anyways. Um, and then secondly, I think like, the, uh, I believe the OP stack started from like a fork of get and now with like the bedrock upgrade, now it's like their own thing. So they kind of like shifted from a fork of get to now bedrock, um, and became their own thing. So it was a, a clearer path for them to do that. We hope in the future that like, uh, users, uh, so right now everyone's kind of like on the OP stack and it's kind of like the, the VC buzzword, um, to like be building on the OP stack. Um, and that's like a whole, whole different conversation about like pitching yourself as a builder on a stack. But we hope that like in the future with a lot of these refactors, with, uh, partnering with teams like Rollkit and Dimension, that when you go to build a rollup, now all of a sudden it's not anymore like, oh, I want to, uh, I'm going to build the OP stack because that's like what everyone else is doing. It's like, okay, now you really ask like, what functionality do I want and what functionality do the, all these things offer in that comparison, like to a certain level, there will be like the Cosmos SDK. Like there are websites already popping up on uh, these like RAS website, the rollup as a service that is like, you can deploy a dimension rollup that uses the Cosmos SDK under the hood. Um, and this, this becomes harder and harder because it's, uh, so like dimension and roll kit, everyone's going to be like deploy a roll kit or like, uh, if you're using, if you want to use Polaris from bear chain, like the de deploy a Polaris rollup. Um, but on the back end, you're most likely using the Cosmos SDK. And so it's like, we want the, so it's like the Cosmos SDK's goal, um, is somewhat to transcend Cosmos that it's like, Hey, like if you're using this framework or using this, uh, virtual machine, you don't necessarily know you're using the Cosmos SDK and it's just kind of like there for you. Um, we hope it goes in that direction and we're really pushing to go in that direction, but I do think it, it was a good choice by optimism to develop their own stack. Um, because of how the SDK was back when they made the decision. Yeah, the infrastructure, like everyone's kind of, uh, it's very easy to raise money. And then in blockchain, um, I'm not like, I don't mean to like call anyone out because it's like Cosmos is the same way. And like everyone is the same way that we just love rebuilding, uh, rebuilding the wheel. And so instead of like, kind of like using something out there, it's like, oh, like we can do it ourselves better. And then it's like, you lose a year developing it. Um, and it's kind of like, been the conundrum that everyone kind of ends up in. And then we have other users who are using Comet 
And when I talked to them about the Cosmos SDK, they're like a year into building their state machine. And they're like, yeah, we should have just used the Cosmos SDK because it is very hard to build your own state machine. Right. I, I definitely think that is sort of the case. If you just look at the cycle and then how, how it plays out and how the new bus comes along right now, again, I think, but maybe, you know, out of all of this experimentation, right, I guess that's sort of the, the thing too, that the best emerges, right? There's also like some competition and we, with a better infrastructure to actually build applications that users use when, when they come. So I guess that's the hope. I do think maybe because we also had the hyper SDK uh, Patrick on from Avalabs, maybe you can, can you like explain, I, because I think his, or I guess their approach is much, it's very like performance focused, right? It's kind of like he's building this thing to like really be super like performant versus, and, and I, I guess maybe just your views of, of what they're building and how, how that maybe works in a like IBC Cosmos SDK world. Can they interoperate somehow or how's your... Yeah, I think, um, I mean, Hyper SDK is like very cleanly written, um, like hats off to Patrick and that team. It is very performant. It, I do think it's like a, definitely a different approach to users. And I also think that their license has like some weird, like need to use, need to build on Haba to be able to use it or something like that. Um, I, I thought I, I thought I read that a, a couple weeks ago. The SDK is like, so the early days of SDK was always like on um, liveness and safety. Um, and this has kind of been the cornerstone of like uh, Tendermint and now Comet and also uh, IPC. And so it's always been safety and liveness and performance hasn't been the highest kind of like priority for the Cosmos SDK and the, and the interchain stack as developers. Now this is all shifting. So it's like we do feel comfortable with the amount of safety and liveness that we have achieved within all these different layers in the stack. And now it's like, now we're rewriting or refactoring levels to become extremely performant. And so we are moving in that direction. I do think that like there is a team that's like building on Ava and that's uh, integrating IBC and to be kind of like the entry point into Avalanche. Um, so there is like exciting stuff going on that like IBC is going beyond. Um, but I do think within their world, um, like they, it, they would kind of need Avalanche, they would kind of need IBC to like go out of Avalanche trustlessly without a multi-sig bridge. But within like their subnets, there isn't really a need for IBC because they have their own communication protocol that fits their needs. Um, and so it's really IBC, like we kind of, in the early days it was, oh, like we have blockchains, but now all these blockchains are silos. We need a bridging protocol. And then now we have uh, multi-sig bridges between ecosystems. And then we have trustless bridging within ecosystems. And now the question is like, how do we get trustless bridging between ecosystems? Yeah, to me, it does seem that, you know, because everyone else, it seems like from out, from some observations, I guess that pushing more their stack and like trying to blend the token in, even these licenses, what you mentioned, Mark, where I guess the Cosmos approach is the most friendly to like outside contributors and sort of adoption, but I guess there's still pressure from all these investors and from value accrual to maybe like not use that. So yeah, I do think maybe this is going <laughs> to remain an issue for a long, long time. P people in Cosmos and Polkadot ecosystem, like, like three years ago, like you could raise money saying you built on Polkadot, like two years ago, you could say you could raise money saying you're building off the Cosmos, building in Cosmos. Now you can raise money saying you're building off the OP stack or something. Next year, it could be something else. And the year after that, it's something else. And the thing that always comes back to the team that sold as we are building on X stack, now the VCs come back and say, hey, why are you still building on that stack? Why don't you go to this other stack? And it's just becoming more and more like, hey, like um, people, like uh, a friend of mine got asked the same question from a VC, like, hey, like, why are you still on Polkadot? And it's just kind of like, the stack doesn't necessarily matter. It's like asking, like, why is the backend written on Express instead of in Node.js instead of Rust? It's like, it doesn't matter as long as there's a product that people are using on the front end. One of the big differences between the Ethereum, uh, Ethereum ecosystem and the Cosmos ecosystem is in the Ethereum ecosystem, like one can imagine like the, the roadmap of having all of these rollups or L2s as being focused on developing a new form of bridging technology. 
meaning that um, the idea is that if I am uh, I'm on Ethereum mainnet, and if I bridge some tokens onto a an L2 or a rollup, if some misbehavior happens on the rollup, I can go to back to the Ethereum mainnet, presumably submit some kind of fraud proofs, although that functionality is not live on many of the uh, L2s today. But the ultimate vision is I should be able to um, present a fraud proof and get my Ether or my ERC20 tokens back on the Ethereum mainnet. And one can really imagine this as, okay, this is this is a form of bridging technology. It's it's a bridge with kind of like fraud proofs on on one side, but you could also imagine that same technology being like fraud proofs on the other side. Meaning, if I my tokens originated on the rollup, if I took them to on to Ethereum, and then there was a big uh, hack of the Ethereum network itself, then I should be able to go back to the rollup and claim my assets back by submitting the fraud proofs. The, uh, the proofs of the fraud on Ethereum back on the roll. So you can think of like really the centerpiece of Ethereum's ecosystem roadmap is bridges should be built in that particular way. And it is really opinionated on like that being the correct way to build bridges. The Cosmos ecosystem, well, bridges are kind of like built differently where it's actually pretty much the same functionality except that the focus is not there on fraud proofs and being able to reclaim your assets if there's Byzantine behavior on the other side. So meaning, if there's two chains, A and B, if I take my assets from A to B in the Cosmos ecosystem and there's a major attack on chain B, then I necessarily don't have out-of-the-box technology to go back to chain A, present some kind of fraud proof and get my assets back. It is assumed that if that case happens, well, the community will will figure it out. The software developers will figure it out and get the assets back and in the right hands. Like, do you, why, why do you think this difference exists, and why doesn't the Cosmos ecosystem also invest in like fraud-proof technology? You you could say that social consensus is more the Ethereum way than automating it. Um, but, um, no, I, I do think so, uh, the Celestia team worked very hard to get like fraud proofs working within the SDK, like, um, uh, single round fraud proofs. And we are working on like upstreaming it and like, uh, working and allowing teams to use it. Um, and so there will be like better functionality out there to use fraud proofs. Um, we are experimenting with different like commitment structures to do different things, um, to make it more efficient and or we're going to start researching in the in the fall and leading into the next year um, around validity proofs and how we can really play around with um, well validity proofs and also like zk technology within the cosmos sdk just because the cosmos ecosystem has somewhat been lacking in that um in that space um I, i'd say it's just it's just an area that hasn't been quite explored that drastically yet but there's becoming there's more and more discussions coming up, and so there, uh, the Cosmos Hub is talking about doing like more of a social consensus fraud proof until fraud proofs are like kind of proven to work in the SDK, in the Cosmos SDK, and then there's uh, Osmosis recently announced that they will be working with Celestia and using fraud proofs for mesh security related things, and so there is a, an adoption of fraud proofs and different um, different types of, fraud, of, of proofs being adopted in the Cosmos ecosystem. But I, I will say that we are lagging a bit compared to, I mean, not necessarily because there, like you said, there are some rollups that uh, don't have fraud proofs yet. I um, mean, they're still working on it. And so there is a world that there is a, you could say that like we are exploring it the same way other teams are exploring it as well. Yeah, I guess it might just not be as central to the narrative and like, I guess for Celestia, maybe more so than other cosmos but i guess in ethereum you have to like highlight that you're doing this to keep the ethereum community like on your side in a way yeah to, to make people happy and so it, it's been talked about here and there in, in cosmos but yeah it's kind of like oh like someone talks about it brings it up we talk to teams um about it dimension um, osmosis announced celestia and so on 
and different ways to like design um, with role kits in mind and with uh, I think it's Diamond um, from Dimension in mind, like how to do it with, with fraud proofs. And so there is that discussion going on, it's just not um, front and center. Right. Cool. Yeah. Um, I think we're like hitting the hour mark. So it's a very good uh, discussion. I really hope people learned a lot about like um, you know, blockchain specific frameworks from, from the OG himself and like probably one of the most knowledgeable people across the ecosystem. So really uh, exciting to hear from you and, and being able to hear like the lessons you've learned over the years. I think maybe um, to wrap it up, we can talk a little bit about, you know, what, where can people get involved with the Cosmos SDK? Uh, how, how do you get in touch with team? How do you build on the Cosmos SDK? Yeah. So, I mean, there's multiple ways. And if you're a new project um, and not only need technical help, there is the Interchain Builders program. And it's not limited to blockchains. Like if you're doing a roll up using any part of the Interchain stack, like you could only be using IBC, you could be using um, Comet, Rollkit, um, the Cosmos SDK, Cosmos, and the list really goes on. If you need help with um, anything outside of the tech, you can definitely um, go to the Interchain Builders program. And then for tech wise, um, really our Discord and our GitHub discussion board. So if you go to the Cosmos um, GitHub organization, there's a community discussion board where we're uh, constantly answering questions about the Cosmos SDK, how to build with it. Um, and there's tutorials, um, they're being updated for the upcoming release. Um, it, the ecosystem's really excited about that. There's a lot of fixes, a lot of deletion of code for writing modules and uh, interacting with VMs. And so the UX is only getting better. Awesome, Marco. Thanks so much for coming on to Epicenter. And yeah, have a great week. Likewise, thanks for having me.